Hi, welcome to Wise Beyond Bitcoin, your home for the crypto neo news, education, and opportunity. My name is Ryan. I'm Jacob. And we're taking a look at uh, some, some inflation news today, and not to mention news, but also a new way of, uh, taking a, of, of measuring inflation, of, of actually uh, getting, a, getting to grips with what that number is. But before we jump into that story, kind of want to talk about some of our playlists that we've put together. We do a lot of uh, focus on secret networks. So we have a whole secret NFT playlist where all, the, all things NFTs on secret are discussed. So much innovation happening there that it's, uh, it needs its own playlist, right? And uh, beyond that, we have a whole playlist on how to get started with your crypto journey, how to get a Kepler wallet, how to stake, send, all that, how to select a validator, how to, because uh, that's important. Uh, you know, there, there are rewards that come with, with, uh, with participation, but not all validators are equal. So there's, there's some hints in there on how to maximize your rewards. We also look at the macro outlook because there's so much going on in the world with war and supply chain issues, with monetary policy and inflation, and so much of that impacts the crypto markets and financial markets in general. So we, we take a look at that and, and try to update you on what's going on with that. Of course, this is not financial advice. We are not here uh, for commercial, legal, financial, or any other kind of advice. This is just infotainment and uh, take it with a grain of salt. Well. Today, uh, we, got the, we got word that there is going to be some inflation numbers coming out tomorrow, and the White House says, brace, they are going to be extraordinarily elevated. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the problem continues. And that, you know, that's, that's not, sus not surprising. You know, it, it, every month it seems to get a little higher. I remember, I think, last, this month it was 7.9, or I mean, uh, the previous month, the number was 7.9%. So, and it, that was elevated from the month prior. And these things tend to... You know, tend to uh, escalate right like it, before they get better. So I'm not surprised to see, especially with all the things going on with the war and uh, the way that global trade is being upset by the sanctions on Russia and and how all that is going to impact um, you know commodity prices and energy prices. You know, it's it's pretty clear that that's going to be inflationary. But that's not the focus of our our um, our video today. Rather, it's it's talking more, what we're talking about today is, is a new app called Trueflation, which has, it's an, it's an alternative measure, right? It's, it's, it's a blockchain based project. It's censorship resistant and it uses an Oracle. It uses a uh, chain link to, to cap, to, to, uh, to have, to get the price data that it feeds into its model. And I, and one of the things that, you know, jumps out at me when I think about that is, all right, we're in a period of elevated inflation. I wonder if the number that we're going to get, how, are they accurate? Are they, are they, you know, they under reporting it? Is, is this a true number? Is, was it really 7.9% last month or was that a, you know, a, a gamed number? So these, and that's, and that's not to say anything, that's not a knock on any one party or any one president. That's just like an, a realization that, Hey, there's, there's a big motivation to, to have this number be less than what it really is. And for inflation to not to be a problem, right? And and given the incentives facing people in office, that you know it goes it it's, it it, re, it goes without saying that there could be some thumb on the scale kind of behavior here, where where the number where the inflation numbers are, you know are are reduced from what they really are. There's a sort of an objective subjective element here. Is what you know is it is it really that or is that a, a number that you've massaged, right? And that's you know, kind of makes you think about the old quote from Mark Twain about statistics, you know, about there being lies and damn lies and then statistics, right? So, so that's that's something that's perennial in in, in politics. This the issue with gaming these numbers and what all goes into it. So to see a blockchain project trying to solve that dilemma, or at least trying to give us more data, you know that that's great. It's, it had my attention when I first heard about it. So this is where I came across it. Uh, so we'll have these links in the description. But the project's called Trueflation, and it it right now the number it spits out is a little over thirteen percent, which is a significantly higher than what the official statistics from the CPI are. So that that is giving you an idea of um, of what a different metric might look like, and maybe how things are worse than they seem. And. I, w I would even add to that the the framework that we're using and this article explains it right here is a hundred years old. I mean, 
we can digitalize things and digitize things now and have a better way to track. And I, I think one of the great uh, ways that Trueflation tracks is they track the raw price data fed into it rather than a curated sample. And right. so by doing that, you're getting a more accurate number because you're looking at the raw price data. That's right. Yes, that's it's something that I, I re, was reminded, you know, reading this article because, you know, we, me and Lucas were both did the economics degree in college and and this, uh, you know, how they how they get that data how and how that's how the numbers are crunched. We went through this, you know, so, yeah, it is like you say, it's survey data, which means that they they take samples of price data in different parts of the economy. And then but but the question is, is who's designing that sample? What are the metrics? What are they what are they including? What are they excluding? And, um, you know, and, and how is that handled? And that's where I guess that that's one avenue where some some of the gamification can happen, right? Where where the number can be understated. And that's that's one big problem with with this old way of doing things, right? With, with relying on these surveys when when in reality we have the tools to just track it in real time, like you say. So it's definitely we're definitely looking at innovation in a place that doesn't see a lot of innovation <laughs> to say the least. I think um, it's so awesome to see. No doubt. Now there's um, one thing. Yeah. This, re this reiterates the problem that the CPI is essentially a black box. They don't know who made the survey, how it was made, who, how it was executed. And it's dubious whether or not that it's, that it's really reflective of, of real price data and, and how reflective is it? And so Trueflation, it, it sources data from real-time markets like Zillow and Penn State and Nielsen and other, other sources. Uh, that does include the similar, a similar basket from what the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses, but they also have other things being substituted. Um, and yeah, that's... And so one thing that I wanted to touch on before, this article pretty much covers that, what we just talked about here, but there's more to say about avenues of, of manipulation in the CPI data. And uh, what I would mention is that there's these things called hedonic quality adjustments. And this is a, and, th and these make sense to some degree. Like it's the whole point of it's not, it's not ridiculous. And what, what does this mean? Okay. So what the CPI does is it tracks changes in, in the prices of certain goods and the idea and, and those changes, it tries to track inflation so that it tries to track the, the, the part of the price change that's based in the, the value of money going down, right? Or, or in something, some monetary uh, dimension. But it doesn't want to capture like a quality improvement. So say like with your cell phone, for example, if you were paying uh, a certain amount of money, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago for, a, for yourself, 15 years ago for your cell phone, you wouldn't just, uh, you wouldn't want to compare that to what's being spent today because cell phones today are very different from cell phones yesterday. Right. They do things that the ones in the past didn't do. Right. They have GPS and they have, you know, you can do FaceTime. They're, they're little computers. So it's really not just about making a phone call. So this these quality improvements have to be adjusted for so that when these when the inflation data come out, you're not capturing quality. You're capturing just changes in the value in the in the in the in the product price and holding everything else constant. That's the idea. Well, it makes sense to do this, but of course. These adjustments open up an avenue for the kind of gamification manipulation we were talking about earlier with the survey data. And that also applies to what's called the seasonal adjustment. These, these things happen, uh, these are revisions that happen after data has already been announced. And what they, what they do is they make, they make uh, adjustments that, that, uh, that kind of uh, that compensate for whatever might be happening during that season, right? So if you're talking about production cycles and in, in agriculture or climate conditions changing or, or how holidays impact sales, there's various things that can, that can change uh, based purely on the season, the time of year. So these, these seasonal adjustments are also another avenue for, for things to be gamified and for inflation to be understated. And so all in all, like, I just wanted to point to these things as, as saying that, they, that, the, that the argument that was in this Coindesk article is actually stronger than what they're even saying, because there's more than just the survey data uh, as an, uh, just, it's more than just the survey design, which opens up a possibility for gaming and the inflation numbers. There's all these other adjustments that happen too. So, and I'm not, I'm not, get, I'm not sold on the idea that trueflation um, 
is the perfect measurement, right? Because we're looking at, we're saying how we want to get closer to objectivity, but there's always these, these adjustments and these other factors that have to go into it, which, which make it a bit of a subjective thing, you know, like who's doing the adjustment and, and how is it, how is it quantified and, and all of that. Right. But with that said, just seeing competition, just seeing another, another number, another, another method, and hopefully, you know, o- over time it gets even better and, and it becomes, you know, this, this is the kind of thing we need as, you know, as we lose, as we lose faith a little bit in our institutions and in our, in each other, uh, having more info, well, hopefully if anything, keep us honest, keep, keep us a little more honest. Right. I would agree. Like, it's part of the reason that I think that this is so amazing as a crypto project, because this is a web three crypto project is the fact that they're using chain link oracles. And it really goes to show yep. the powerhouse that the infrastructure that crypto is creating. Right. I agree. Yep. And I just show in the website, you can go to this, uh, it's app.trueflation.com. Um, and you can see the, the breakdown of the categories of how, how much things are going up in the various categories. Um, and then you can see the weights, right? So for example, food is weighted 13.9% of, of the total basket that they're measuring. And you can click on the others and look at and them and see them in detail. You can see the, the year to date change as well as the current day change. And then what makes up the basket of, of for food. And then you see the, the trajectory it's gone on year to date or six months or one month. So there's a lot of data here and they're very transparent. That's what I like about it. It's very transparent, very easy to use, very clean uh, you, you know, user interface. So yeah, this looks like a very cool project. Um, all in all, as inflation becomes more of a problem, I guess we can start talking about what are the potential solutions, right? In crypto, like what do you, what do, you do whenever? Because obviously just buying and holding doesn't seem to be working. Uh, you know, the, the inflation is, is, uh, first of all, each just eats into your, into the value of your coins. But secondly, it causes the fed to react with higher interest rates and selling off their, their balance sheet. Cause we're in a monetary, you know, um, corrective phase and that's not good for, for prices on anything, right. Except for gold. <laughs> and it <laughs> seems like so, but there are options in crypto that are safer than just buying Bitcoin and ETH. Right. And, and, and you can still kind of hedge against inflation this way, right? And absolutely. And the major way that I would express doing that is stablecoin yield farming. Uh, when you have a stablecoin, it's pegged to the U.S. dollar. So uh, ultimately, the idea of a stablecoin is to be an alternative to the U.S. dollar that you could use in the crypto space as U.S. dollar. And because there's right. no price change between the two, you're not paying a uh, capital gains tax for, you know, having more U.S. dollar. What you're doing is you're, you're locking it up in a protocol where you're earning interest over time. And you could yep. lock, you lock it up in like UST with the anchor protocol, anchor. the earning yeah. 20%. And if you look at the uh, current year to date, uh, I mean, at 13.9% inflation, even though that is a high number, you're still at... You're still beating it. You're still beating it. You're still beating it and also gaining value by using right. your protocol. That's right. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because we got a video we're going to be doing later this week talking about some of the risks surrounding Acre in that 20% number and UST in general. But that's not... That's a little far afield from this video, but that is coming. So yeah, look look out for that. Um, regarding the stable coins, yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, the more I, the more time I spend in crypto, the more I see the merit of of the of that asset class, you know, and and um, the more I kick myself for not having a bigger position <laughs> in stables. <laughs> right. But um, but this is not financial advice. We're not like I say. We're just shooting the breeze. These are just options. Um, but all in all, I love to see this this new metric come out. And I think this is the kind of thing that blockchain, you know, needs to look at. Is is how how can we how can we um, provide tr- more accurate information? Because that seems to be a thing that we're that everybody left, right, center is complaining about is misinformation and not being able. To, not only that, but not not being able to trust the um, you know the institutions as well. So. These are, this is the kind of solutions that, you know, hopefully we can see more of and as time goes on. Yeah. Well, it's always been a fun, 
fun chatting with you about these issues. Um, yeah. Until next time. Until next time. Namaste.